checked in at the table. Have you all done that? Yes, there's nods there. No handshake, hugs, kisses, high fives, elbow bumps are okay. So the question has been this morning, is an elbow bump a replacement for a kiss? So all the guys that I've given elbow bumps to, does that mean I've just kissed them? That's a bit scary, isn't it? Anyway, so please adhere to that. Please do not move the chairs unless to make up a household or family group. Um, when we break for a cuppa and have a chat, please collect your morning tea and return to your seat as quickly as possible, as our gatherings must remain seated. Morning tea will conclude 15 minutes after the service ends. It's pretty tight stuff, isn't it? But we're here. But we are here. So I think that is um, the thing that is very significant to us, and uh, we'll see how we go with everything what is going to happen is we're going to have some readings and, and different stuff like that. And I'm going to start off um, this morning for us um, with just something that I found a couple of months ago. It says this, God, our provider, we walked into church today needing you in different ways. Some of us need strength because we're facing a big challenge. Some of us need hope because we are, we actually feel like giving up. Some of us need love because we feel alone. We trust that you will provide for us, whether through words or whether through thought process or in a quiet moment of reflection. You are here. You are with us. Amen. Over the next few weeks, we will be looking at specifically um, Psalms. We can't have hymns and spiritual songs, so we're going to have the Psalms. They're not going to take that away from us. So Roy is going to start uh, reading for us from Psalm 46. And I will ask those who read if they can come to this microphone, and those who pray go to this microphone. And in between, I will get the Glen 20 and spray. Not the person the microphone. So if Roy can come and read to us this great psalm, God is our refuge and strength. Thanks, mate. Ah, yes. Okay. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Thanks, Roy. That was the, um, that was the Bible reading that I had the very first day of lockdown. Uh, and it stayed with me. And so I'll be preaching about that in a little while. But it's something that stayed with me for the whole time of, um, of, the, um, 
of the lockdown or the, the time that we've been separated, and we'll have a think about that. Uh, next, I just want to address the thing I said before. Um, Ephesians 5 and verse 19 uh, actually says, um, no, I've probably missed that. It actually says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart. Now, as I mentioned, we can't do the, um, the hymns and the, um, and the spiritual songs. We're not allowed to. But the thing with it is, we can use the psalms and we can do that in different ways. So over the next three or four weeks, we will be investigating different ways that we can utilise the psalms as worship. But one thing that I want to bring out is this statement here, even silence cannot stop our worship to the Almighty God. We can worship in any state and we need to be remembering that over the next period of time. We need to remember that we don't need music and songs. Music and songs is just a tool. Silence can be just as big a concept for us to use as worship, but we've got to get ourselves used to that. And that's something that is significant, I think, for us to be able to, um, to take hold of. Just in, in the way of explanation, what will happen is if you want to say amen, you can raise your right hand with a thumb, Okay. Now, that can be an act of worship. If you want to say hallelujah, two hands, okay? That does not make you Pentecostal if you don't want to be. But it means that you can communicate and that we can agree with each other in the spirit of the Lord. So if I see a thumb up, okay, I know where you're going. Okay, Gary's practicing that for me now. Um, He's actually done a lot of that because when he says the video camera is on, he's gone like that because we noticed the first time he said, go, and I didn't hear it. So here what we have is we have ways of communicating. Also, we have a more modern format. If you want to make comment on something, you have the right to use right now in the middle of church your phone to SMS me, not to ring me, okay? don't ring me. Uh, My number is on the screen. It will be on the screen a couple of times during the morning. If you want to text me and say something, I may not comment on it, but typing something can be just as much an act of worship as perhaps singing can. So if you've got your your phones with you, you can text something. Um, We may, I may comment on it. If you say you don't want to comment it on, that's fine as well. Um, but it's there for us to participate, to participate together in worshipping God. Next, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have Margaret come and read to us from Psalm chapter 8. Now, she may get up here and tell you that this is going to be read at her funeral. This is just a practice, okay? This is my favourite psalm. And uh, as John says, I'm going to have it at my funeral. I might keep the tape from this morning and play me saying it. Mm. That'll bring a tear to your eye, won't it? (laughs) I'm reading from Eugene Peterson's um, uh, translation. And uh, here we go. God, brilliant Lord, yours is a household name. Nursing infants gurgle choruses about you. Toddlers shout songs that drown out enemy talk and silence atheist babble. I look up at your macro skies, dark and enormous, your handmade sky jewellery. Moon and stars mounted in their settings. Then I look at my micro self and wonder, why do you bother about us? Why take a second look our way? Yet we're so narrowly amiss being gods, bright with Eden's uh, dawn light. You put us in charge of your handcrafted world, repeated to us your Genesis charge. Make us lords of sheep and cattle, even animals out in the wild, birds flying and fish swimming, whales singing in the ocean deeps. God, brilliant Lord, your name echoes around the world.
Thank you, Margaret. Ross is going to pray for us, and um, we'll have a few prayers throughout the morning, and uh, Ross is going to pray and respond pretty much to um, that psalm as well. I, di I didn't know that we were going to have those psalms and you're going to get a part of another one now, whether you like it or not. Um, psalm 19, I want to ring the, uh, read the first four verses. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night. They display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. <coughs> their voice goes out into all the world, their words to the ends of the world. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank and praise you for your creation, the sun, moon, stars, the flowers, trees, all things that we see on a daily basis. Help us to appreciate your hand, handiwork more and more. We thank you especially for your sending your unique son, Jesus, to earth <coughs> to live among us and then to die on a cross, taking our punishment <coughs> for sin Help us to remember and appreciate his sacrifice. We thank you for our <coughs> excuse me. We thank you for our federal and state leaders as they make decisions on the current COVID crisis. Continue to guide them at this time. Thank you for the opportunity we have today to meet together face to face. Thank you for the work that John, Gary, Cathy and Sally and others have done to enable us to do this, to be here. We have much to praise and thank you for. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, to Ross, for that. Much appreciated. We're trying out a couple of different mic systems this morning. Now, I've, I've turned on to the lapel mic. Um, so, if can you hear me okay with everything? Um, okay, there's a few amens there, so that's good. So, we're going to try this. Um, this one's nice. It's a very good one, but uh, we'll try this for a little while as well. Um, I'm just going to pop that down. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, as we continue, uh, we're going to look at um, what I actually preached from uh, last week, if you uh, will fo have been following along with our, our services online. I preached from Nehemiah chapter 1. And it's just a, a great template for us. Oops, I may be a little bit loud when I look down. Uh, it's a great template for us. It's the peas that do it. I might drop down a little bit. It's a great template for us to, to look at how we pray and, and how we show respect to the Almighty God. It says this, And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him, and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the utmost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place I have chosen, to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. 
O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. We're going to pray amongst ourselves. Pray privately, if you want to put it that way, for a couple of minutes and reflect on what that is talking about. That is talking about offering ourselves to God, repenting to God for not only our sin, but the sins of other people. Now, that's a really weird one, I think. But here we have the opportunity to spend some time quietly praying for other people as well as ourselves and repenting within that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can offer to you our prayers. We thank you that you are God who listens to us. We don't exactly know how you're listening to 40-odd people all at once, but we're just so amazed that you do. And you care for each of us. You care for the people that we have prayed for and you care for the situations we have prayed for. We thank you and we praise you. Amen. I just want to say thank you to the people who have already put some texts up um, and some good, some good thumbs up and things like that. Remember too that um, uh, you can do that over the, the length of the, the sermon as well if you want to make comment as well. Uh, next we're going to have a Bible reading uh, from 1 Corinthians and Justin's going to read that uh, to us. <laughs> um, it's good to be back, isn't it? Um, we can choose, I was sitting there thinking, I, I can choose to have an attitude of uh, missing the things we can't do, like singing, or I can choose to have an attitude of celebrating the things that we can do, like being together. And so that's, that's my choice this morning. Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians 3, verses 9 to 16. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Thanks, Thanks Justin, for that. 
Robin's going to lead us in uh, prayer now. And um, this let me w- remind you while she's coming up, you haven't had um, information like this from the pulpit for 15 weeks. Uh, the elections are coming up. We need to be thinking about nominating those people who you think can uh, assist in leading the church on into the future. Uh, if you need to know more information about that, catch up with me afterwards or ring Kathy in the office during the week. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. I'd just like to back up what um, Justin had said. It's really nice to be here and to actually see you in person. There's a, like a couple of people who I've been able to catch up with during the how many ever months or weeks, but it's great that um, just to see you're here and we can still worship God. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I have been reminded during these uncertain times of the hope that we have in you, Lord, for our future. We thank you, Lord, that the hope we have doesn't let pain, struggle, fear and uncertainty have the last word, but knows that transformation is possible a hope that doesn't disregard the difficulties we face, but gives us the strength and determination to keep going. Lord, be with us as we face these uncertain times. We ask for your love and care on all our family, friends and neighbours. May your, your fatherly hand guide, shelter and strengthen them, cast out all anxious fears and doubt. Give us an increasing trust in you and fill our hearts and minds with your peace. We pray for those around the world who are struggling with COVID-19. Heal and comfort those who are sick and suffering. Lord, we pray for all those at BBC. Please continue to provide ways for your people to stay connected uh, to one another. And please strengthen us to care for one another in creative and genuine ways. Please be especially gracious to those who are already finding loneliness hard to deal with and may feel particularly isolated during the weeks ahead. Lord, may we hold, fo- f- may we hold fast to the hope for the future we have in you. Find comfort in your presence today and in the days to come, remembering that you are in complete control. In Jesus' name, amen. It's great for us to be able to be together, but I want to just say thank you to the work that Gary's done over the last 15 weeks. He's taught me a lot about the production of such things, and he's spent more hours than I can imagine, I think. Uh, And I just want to say thank you publicly Uh, to the amount of effort that you've put in. And, um, yeah, it came out pretty good, didn't it? And I might just add to that, it seems very strange being on this side of a camera. (laughs) Psalm 5. Listen to my words, Lord, consider my lament. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God. To you I pray. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my request before you. And wait expectantly. For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. With you, evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty, defeatful Lord, you detest. But I, by your great love, can come into your house. In reverence, I can bow down toward your holy temple. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness. Because of my enemies, make your way straight before me. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with malice. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they tell lies. Declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish from them their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. 
You surround them with your favour as a shield. In a moment, but uh, while he's coming up, I'll just read um, something that's coming out from the Baptist Association. It says, in the light of the lockdowns in Melbourne and the recent increased community transmission in Sydney, there is some indication that restrictions may tighten on public gatherings in New South Wales, and this will inevitably affect our churches. We will be keeping a close eye on the directive from the New South Wales government and will communicate if and when this occurs. We also have a biblical mandate to pay special attention to those most vulnerable within our communities, church and broader community, in this season. We encourage you to please be aware of how any decisions you make affect those who are in this position. I need to um, give credit to the Baptist Association for the way that they've been able to communicate on how things can affect us and how to best deal with it, but also to Cathy because she's had to put it all together and the team of uh, the leadership who have had to make decisions. It's been an amazing thing to sit on Zoom um, and and communicate to each other and talk about what's the best options for us coming back together, the best options for cleaning and the best options for how we do things. So thank you to Cathy and uh, the whole leadership team uh, and it's been an amazing experience. Uh, But as well as that, we've also discovered that we can have slightly different opinions and still find a way to move forward. It's been a great experience. Brian, will you pray for us, please? As we uh, come to God in prayer, um, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, the same uh, theme that um, that Robin mentioned, that of that hope, but particularly focus on uh, our anxiety and uh, depression in some and loneliness. Our Father and our God, during this pandemic, pandemic, many people are struggling with anxiety, loneliness or depression, and sometimes a heavy mix of all three. Father, we need your help. For many of us, anxiety, loneliness and depression quickly becomes overwhelming, and sometimes we feel there's no way out, there's no hope, but there is hope. Father, we know that we can endure or grow, we can't, cannot endure or grow without hope, but you give us hope. When we're anxious, you are in control. In our weakness, you are strong. In our loneliness, you are present. When life is difficult, you remain resolute. Father, help us to listen and offer genuine words of hope to others. But more, Father, help us to offer practical help, uh, to visit, to go out for coffee when, when we can, to go for walks with each other, to connect uh, with a prayer partner or to read and pray a psalm, to journal reflections about scripture or sometimes simply to uh, play or listen to uh, gospel music or, or any music. Father, help us to live one day at a time looking to God for hope, resurrection, uh, reassur- reassurance and forgiveness. Father, we rest in what Christ has already done for us, for our church, our town, our nation, and for the world, and what the Spirit promises to finish through us. Father, we rejoice that you have the ultimate answer to anxiety, loneliness, and depression, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's... um As I said, it's interesting to be able to uh, preach and to talk to you um, with real bodies in front of me. I actually think I'm going to take a little bit of time in my preaching style to get back up to speed on how I preach when there's a crowd there. It's a very different technique and it's something that Gary and I have worked through doing my online technique of of communicating. so bear with me as I sort of get, get up to, to match fitness again, um, but I have been absolutely looking forward to having you in front of me. Uh, we're going to look at that psalm, Psalm 46, and um, as I said, it was the first Bible reading I had 
uh, on that first Monday after the close down uh, of everything happened. And it's got some things in here that, that really affected me uh, at that particular time, but it has hung with me for 15 weeks. So as we go through it, we just follow it through, um, through the passage. If you've got your Bibles, and some of you have got Bibles and, and notepads and stuff like that, that's great. Um, so you can follow it through uh, as we go. God is our refuge and strength. And that first part says, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. I mean, what does that mean to us? And as I've looked at different speakers and different people as they've unpacked it, the passage incredibly has different meaning for different people. And I don't know about you, but when I read some Psalms, they bring up memories. Um, maybe, and, and maybe a Psalm will come up that... Um, that I remember someone preaching on particularly or it's been read at a funeral or different things like that. And what does it mean to us? It has great significance to, to some people. And this now has great significance to me. So why does it? I've unpacked some of the terminology there. And the word refuge is, means that place of safety. And in some ways, this building is our place of safety. We come here, we've set things up for it to be a safe environment so that we can worship God without hindrance. I know it's different from normal, but we come together in this safe place to be able to worship God. What is strength, the concept of? And, and I was looking at um, a commentary from Ben Witherington, and, and he said the concept of strength in this context is the ability to deal with whatever issue is before us. It's not the um, how big a biceps you've got. It's actually referring to the capacity to deal with the issue before us. Samson had great strength. He picked up things and moved them and he, he destroyed things if he had to. Great physical strength. But other people in the Bible had great strength for other reasons. And this particular concept is talking about a strength to deal with issues. Have we felt like in the last 15 weeks we've had the strength to deal with the isolation? The, word, the concept of ever-present speaks for itself, doesn't it? God is ever-present. I don't know whether we always get that. Sometimes I think God doesn't see the, some of the stuff I do. Or he's been off busy looking after the rest of you and he's forgotten something about me. But that's not what this passage says. It says God is a, an ever-present, he's constantly present. And that means that we will always have somewhere to go to feel safe. It means that we will always have the strength to deal with what is in front of us and that we will always have the presence of God. Is that what we've needed? That's what I felt. That was what I needed to hear that very, very first Monday all those weeks ago. And it's been significant for me. And this is a launching point for what the psalmist says in the rest of the passage. It goes on in, in verse 2. Maybe he goes on in verse 2. No, that's the wrong way. That's better. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake in their, with their surging. The result of knowing the information that we started with means that we can deal with issues like this. For the Jewish people, these were big issues. These were the big things. Earthquakes, natural, natural calamity, etc., etc. They were major issues for them. Yet the passage is saying, you're safe. God's with you. It's okay even if this happens. Even if this happens. So even if we have bushfires, even if we have COVID-19, even if we have natural catastrophes, we're safe with God, aren't we? Safe with God. He's always with us. It's that ongoing concept and we need to take hold of that as we go. Interesting... I had a, a look at the word that is translated fear. 
And it not only has the connotation of fear and being afraid, and that, and that we understand, but it also has the concept of being in awe of something. You fear someone because you're in awe of them. Okay? Particularly if it's a very large fellow and he's running at you with a football. For me, I would be very, very scared. But the concept here is it's not just fear of being damaged ourselves, it's fear of the person because we're in awe of them. And that's a bigger concept than we think, isn't it? The issue here is that we will not be intimidated by the issue because we have God's presence with us. We have a safe place. And he's always there. The psalm mentions the natural disasters. And we've been experiencing completely different um, concepts of, of, of a natural disaster, haven't we? Yet there's been people who have gone out of their way, doctors, nurses, police, ambulance drivers and paramedics, etc., etc., and they've been on the front line of everything. And yes, they've been in fear of contracting the virus. But they've still done it, haven't they? They've gone out of their way, they've gone to do their job, despite the fear. Despite the fear. And all credit should be given to them, I think, for what they've been able to do. The passage goes on. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where God most high dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Notice in this passage that it's gone from the the, the imagery of um, catastrophe and storm and earthquake. And now it's gone to this peaceful kind of river. So it's gone on this journey of God has dealt with it. God has dealt with it. So we can actually rest and be comforted in it. The waters aren't a storm anymore. And strangely enough, I've never been to Jerusalem. Who's been to Jerusalem? Okay. Okay. Someone's been to Jerusalem. Amazing experience it must be. I'll talk to you about that sometimes. But apparently there's no river there. It's just a stream or a... Um, a water source. But it's certainly not a river like this seems to give the concept. The concept here is that it's, that it's, a, it's, a, it's a healthy river and it's flowing. Jerusalem has a stream, a small stream. But again, it is the stream that is there is God provided to provide the people within the Jerusalem town, city, with the necessary water that they needed. The picture is one of God providing whatever is needed for life as well as safety. He goes on. There's a bit of a, a roller coaster ride here, isn't there? It goes from calamity to peacefulness. And now we're going back into calamity again. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us and the, the God of Jacob is our fortress. The King James uses the term the Lord of hosts. Not just someone who's big and almighty, but uses the term is, who is the Lord of the multitude. Again, slightly different picture. And notice, you'll notice there that it is the word Lord is in capitals and it is referring to the big name of God, the ultimate concept of God, the personal name of God. It gives us an even bigger image of who this God that we rest safely in, that we have refuge in, and that's with us all the time. The idea is the God that is on our side is the God Almighty. So as we go through life, and often we feel insignificant, the God that we have is the most significant. Again, the mention here of um, the term the God of, of Jacob identifies the relationship to God to the historical people of, of, of Israel. The God who did miracles, they think God of Jacob, they go back through that history, the God who parted the waters, the God who 
who gave Moses the Ten Commandments, the God who, who brought them into the land and gave them the land. All of those things. All of those things. That's how big God is. That's how big the God is. Goes on and says in the next verse, Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. This is an interesting part of the passage. We are told to look at what God's done. I was reading something from um, uh, a journal uh, the other day. Uh, it comes from the Southern Baptist Conference in the United States. And, and they're talking about the whole COVID experience as being a punishment from God. Um, and they've given reasons why it's a punishment from God, okay? And you're just going, yeah, right, whatever you think. But the thing with it is here, <coughs> are we actually looking at what God has done? Now, let me, let me just qualify this a little bit. Is it possible that this is punishment from God? Oh, it's totally possible. Is it actually? I've got no idea. No actually idea. I, I don't understand how we can actually make that statement. But the thing that we have got to do with this particular passage is, is say, it doesn't matter whether it is punishment from God because God is with us and God is for us and we have a relationship with God. You understand where that's coming from? Is it punishment? Don't know. My theological training doesn't cover that. And I'm not sure that it covers those, some of the people who have made those statements either. Is it the last days? That's another thing that people are saying. Don't know. We may be blessed and be living in the last days. How freaky is that? Then again, they thought that when bubonic plague was happening back in the Middle Ages as well. They thought that at the beginning of World War II. They thought of all of that. Where are we at within that? It's our relationship to God that is talked about in this passage that is the vital issue. It is the, our relationship to God. He breaks the bows and shatters the spears. He is the one who has power to deal with it. Okay? And we need, we probably need to theologize amongst ourselves a little bit more on that. And it's a difficult one for us to think about. Maybe there'll be more on that and more discussion on it. But what has God done for you in this COVID period? Frustrated you? <laughs> Some people have expressed that. What has God done for us in the last 15 weeks? Can we identify that there are some things that God has specifically done for us. For me? Yeah. I've been able to spend some different time looking into different parts of the Bible because of people's questions. I've been blessed by the questions that people have had from the sermons that have been given. God's opened up some people's hearts in a slightly different way. That's a blessing. But what has God done for you? We pray and God does things. Now, I'm sure that a lot of us here have been praying that, that the COVID-19 disappears. It'll be nice, isn't it? We've been praying that God does a miracle. We pray for miracles in our family all the time. Don't always happen. Because of God's concepts of what's going to happen in in everything around. I heard a farmer of a farmer out west who, who prayed for rain. And it got to a point where God he felt God wasn't listening. And uh, he would pray every night with his family and they would they would pray around the table. And one night this farmer decided he would not pray. And his little girl picked it up. God, my dad has had enough. He doesn't know what to pray. I know what he wants. Can you bring rain? Because the man and his wife lost it in tears. 
They lost it in tears even more when the next day there was rain. And the funny thing was, he said in his interview, that my little girl prayed and something happened, but I had not bothered to clear out the drains for the last four, uh, five, four or five years. So all of the rain went into the house. Maybe I should have prepared better for God answering prayer. Whoa. Whoa. That's a big concept, isn't it? A lesson from a little girl. We need to prepare ourselves for God to answer our prayers. Where does that take us? We can have the refuge in God. We can be in contact with God. Yet sometimes we don't even think that he's going to work. And the way that we show that he's going to work is because we prepare ourselves for that to happen. If we want revival to happen in our church, we need to prepare ourselves for revival to happen, not just pray for it. Isn't that logical? Actually, if you want to read some history, and you can probably talk to Brian about this, some of our history, our Baptist forebears, prayed in such a way and then prepared themselves as missionaries and prepared other people and disciple people to be able to go. That's our spiritual heritage. What a way about the way that Australia has coped with this COVID situation. I'm not talking about just politicians. By the way, I think the politicians have done an admirable job in a very difficult situation. Some people have let the side down and done the wrong thing. There's a fair bit of prejudice against Victorians at the moment from New South Wales people. It's a bit of a sad situation when you think about it. But we've been very lucky in Australia. When we look at places like Brazil and that right at the moment, South Africa is having a horrible time right as we speak. The South African Baptist Association has put some stuff through uh, and there's no way of stopping it because the people don't in some of those places don't understand what's going on. We need to be praying for them. We need to be praying for them. What has God done? God has saved us in a lot of ways. God has protected us, particularly in our Western communities, very little. What has God done? He's looked after us. What has God done as a church for us? You've looked after each other. The messages that I have got, I've rung someone and said, oh, I just got off the phone to such and such. And as you unpack it, there's been four or five phone calls to that person over the week. You've cared for each other. And what has God done? He's used you lot to encourage you lot and vice versa. It's been amazing, isn't it? What I would like to do in a couple of weeks is have a time where we actually reflect on what God has done for us. So on the 2nd of August, I would like to open it up to people to share how God has dealt with them or how God has... And that's a harsh term. I didn't mean it to come out that way. Um, how God has encouraged you and been with you over the last 15 weeks. Um, so they're probably, if you want to talk about some things, and by the way, we have the radio mics now and we can spray them and we can take them around to you so you don't need to move. What we would like to do is hear about how God has worked in your life over the last 15 weeks. If nobody wants to share anything, you'll get a sermon. I'll come prepared. And if you want to share what God's done and the sharing takes enough time, I dare say we don't need a sermon. So come prepared in two weeks' time. And that's assuming nothing changes too much in the next two weeks. It's all very scary, isn't it? But one thing I want to share with you, just in finishing, it says in this next part, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. Stop and think about that. I stopped and thought about it, and I don't know whether any of you actually look at, um, I do a three-minute snippet on a, a Facebook page called Veranda Church Project each week, and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Be still and know that I am God. That's what God said to me 15 weeks ago, but I didn't. I worked flat out. I worked really, really hard because there were things that had to be done. And in some ways I missed 
God's directive to be still. I recognize that now. And that's difficult to recognize you've missed something. Yeah, I've done, we've done some great work. We've been able to achieve all of the stuff that we had to do. It's blessed people, yeah. But I think I needed to take notice of this verse a little bit more. Sometimes we have to read God's scriptures and take them a lot more literally than we think. Be still and know that I am God is not in there as a nice pretty statement. It's in there because God wants us to do it. He wants us to be still and recognize him. And as I said, I worked flat out. We did good stuff. Um, God is still God. Life experience happens, happens. Sickness, health, good and bad, better for worse. Sounds like marriage, doesn't it? But within all of that, God gives us directives and we've got to be very, very careful to take note of what he says. And we can worship and praise and exalt him any way we want, but I get the feeling he wanted worship and praise in a still situation. He gave us that opportunity for 15 weeks to be still before God. I hope and pray you had that opportunity. I hope and pray that you availed yourself of the time that was made available to you. Now, it wasn't made available to everybody. I understand that. Some people didn't stop working. Marianne didn't miss a day of school through the whole time. Neither did the boys. They went to school every day because they had, Marianne had a job to do. And Flynn's concept, concept was that if he stayed home, he wouldn't have got any work done. And uh, it worked, didn't it? You did well this term. Good on you, mate. Some people didn't get the option. Nurses and, and doctors and people like that didn't get the option. Some people needed to take advantage of the situation and listen to God in a different way. Now, this passage finishes with an awesome statement. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We go back to the beginning about the concept of refuge and fortress. It's a safe place. God is our safe place. God is our safe place. The Lord Almighty is with us. This is just a different way of saying what the first verse said. Does that mean the psalm comes in a big circle? Yes, psalms do that a lot. But if it says it at the beginning and at the end, the psalmist wants us to get the point. The point. And the point is, God is with us. He is our safe place. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity that we have to be in your presence and know that you are God and know that you are our safe place. Keep us in a permanent state of remembering that. Lord, we love you. We really want to do what is right by you. So help us to listen to your word and be still when you say, be still. We also ask, Lord, that you will help us to be your people in this new era and this new situation that we find ourselves. And Lord, as we now go to morning tea, and we do it differently because we have to stay seated, Lord, we ask that our fellowship in a different setting will strengthen us and keep us. Now to each one of us, now may the grace, mercy and peace of God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit remain with each of us until you come. Amen.